game now, say now, let's get away now, away with words, words like we say each and every day, away with words, what to the name, what do you say, so many words at the end of the day, I talk, you talk, they talk, we all talk, away with words, away with words. Today, Away With Words comes from Corby in Northamptonshire. Until the 1930s, Corby was just another rural market town. But then a steelworks was built and the town was transformed. With steel came a massive influx of workers, most of whom were Scottish. Their influence has been so important that the town coat of arms now bears a raven holding a block of steel. But why a raven? Well, it just so happens that a Corby, spelt with an I-E, is Lowland Scots for, guess what, a raven or crow. But where are all these Scots now? Ah, here's one. Leanne Campbell. She's the All England Scottish dancing champion. Of course, she has to wear traditional dress, a kilt from the Danish kilt it up, to tuck up, made from tartan, an old French word. Pain. Cheers. Cheers. Charlie. Slanger. 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 Nice to see you down here. Right. God bless Slanger's you. Gaelic for cheers. You see, I found them. Now, I'm drinking lager, but this is whiskey, and whiskey is the most famous word to come out of Scotland, arguably. And it comes from the Gaelic, whiskey beta, which means. Whiskey bar. Whiskey bar. The water. The water of life. Whiskey is water and bather yeah. is life. And another Gaelic word is galore, and it means to sufficiency. Gentlemen, a toast I to sufficiency. <laughs> Cheers. Here we go again. Cheers. God bless all. I hear music. Gaelic is a rich source of words. One popular word used the world over comes from the Gaelic for battle cry. Slog gim. The English version, slogan, now has more to do with advertising than war. <laughs> Clan is Gaelic for family. And Mac means son of. Just as some English names end in Robin's son, uh, MacDonald could easily be Donald's son. But there's also Donald's son. But we won't go into it. Yeah. Son of Donald, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Four-year-old Emily Radomski is the third generation in her family to maintain the Scots tradition in Corby. And I certainly wouldn't like to argue with her. So, the Scots stayed. And why not? Because Corby now looks completely different. Old factories have given way to new industries, and a once smoky, grimy town now has a strict environmental policy. Hi, Paul. Hiya. Thanks for this. Um, anything I can do? Yeah, you can Canals which flourished in the 19th century still run through the region. Today, instead of goods, they carry pleasure seekers. And where there's people, you find words. Many hands make light work. And now it's locked. That's why it's called a lock. The word canal comes from the Latin canna, meaning reed or pipe, something hollow anyway. And from that, the French got the word chanel, and from chanel, we got the word channel. Barge comes from a Greek word, baris, originally a flat bottom sailing boat for carrying grain. Strictly speaking, this is a canal boat and not a barge. 
a canal barge would be twice as wide and you could only get one of them in a lock like this. With a navigation system as old as this one, you're sure to find lots of stories. After all, these canals were the motorways of the Industrial Revolution. Must have been uh, quite a tough life being a bargee then. Oh yeah, they had um, big companies that used to come up and down, and they used to have little knives running up, and uh, if your rope got in the way, it just spliced the rope. We'd cut the other guy's rope? Yeah. Oh. It's not where argy bargy comes from, is it? In fact, it, it is, yeah. <laughs> Learn something every day. Now, what can Brian Collins of the Stoke Bruin Museum tell me? Brian, tell me, why are so many boats and utensils around here all decorated with roses and castles? Roses and castles? Well, this was a type of decoration that was applied to the Midland narrowboat that people actually lived on, that they used as their home, as well as actually earning their living from travelling along the canal delivering cargo. So what would you keep in here? Your fresh water, I imagine? Yeah, this was all you got to put your fresh water in. Nowadays, you've got facilities, you know, regularly spaced along the canal to meet the needs of the modern boater. Yeah, you know, I heard it's the same with the pubs. You know, at one time they weren't pubs. They were more or less like truck stops for the bargees. <laughs> oh, hey, hang on. Bargees. Have to be careful, you know. Ah, is bargee This a word bargee, word? yes, indeed, yeah. Well, tell me it, why. Well, this boat we're on, uh, it's a boat, oh, of not course. a barge. Oh, of course. No, yeah, I know And that. the people that worked and lived on them were boat people. Is that where argy bargee came from? <laughs> it might be, but I think we've got to get into an argy bargee. No, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, I think so. Let's make sure it's boat people. OK, boat people are boat people, and you don't say that other B word. Right, boat people. Navigation is from the Latin navigare, to sail. An early word for a canal was a navigation, and that's how the men who built them became known as navvies. And this tunnel is the longest navigable tunnel in the country. It's called Blissworth Tunnel. It's on the Grand Union Canal in Northamptonshire. We get the word tunnel from the old French tonnel, which used to mean a long hollow net used for catching birds or fish. I don't suppose there are any birds or fish in here, maybe a few bats. Well, I could chug along all day like this, but alas, the search for words leaves no time for leisure. Another traditional craft that's had to move with the times is that of the blacksmith. In the old days, most of their work would have been shoeing horses with a little decorative work on the side. Nowadays, it's mostly decorative work, on practical things like gates and railings that takes up their time and skill. Nevertheless, the age-old sayings that come from the forge are still in use today. This forge has been in one family for five generations. Today it's run by two brothers, Tim and Dave Jones. Hello, Dave. Hi, oh, Neil. No. Are you just about to go at it hammer and tongs? Not if I can help it. Why is that? Well, we don't like using tongs. Um, every blacksmith I know um, says that they prefer to hold things in their hands if they can. I see you've got an iron in the fire. I've got one ready to work oh, here, right. yeah. Um, we don't want too many irons in the fire, of course. If we have too many in there, we might have, might have the danger of burning one. They used to say that uh, this noise of actually hitting the anvil between the beats um, was a way of keeping the devil away. Um, really? Does it get cooler, uh, faster as it gets thinner? As it gets thinner, it does, yes. So, so there's, uh, there's less work that we can actually do to it. Strike while the iron is hot. Exactly. An old English word for a torch was a brand. And that's probably how we get the phrase brand new, because red-hot irons resemble torches, or brands. We have an N for Neil. I had no idea you were doing that. <laughs> Wow. Be careful, it's still warm. It? It's still warm. All right. Oh, that's thanks very much. Actually, I think it should stand for nuisance. <laughs> Dave, thank you very much. Cheers, Dave. Hmm. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll have some gates like these. 
and I'll certainly know where to get them made. Anyhow, join me after the break for a load of old cobblers. Welcome back. This is the factory of R. Griggs, home of the world-famous Doc Martin's Airware. I know I promised you a load of old cobblers, but I was being economical with the truth, just to get a well-known phrase in. That's television for you. Anyway, to put the record straight, a cobbler is a shoe repairer, whereas this lady here is a shoe maker. Considering the Dr. Martin boot started life as an orthopedic shoe, it's rather surprising that it's become such a fashion statement. Ask Whitney Houston, Liam Gallagher, Boy George, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Even Mike, the cameraman, wears them. But they didn't do our lads much good in Paris, did they? Right. This is Graham Ward, master cord wainer and head of training for Doc Martins. So, Graham, what exactly is a cord wainer? Well, a cordway and there is just uh, another name for a shoemaker, and it's the, the old name. Um, in, uh, many years ago, people who made shoes in London actually used leather from uh, a place called Cordoba in Spain, where they made very fine leathers. Yeah. And, and the way in a part is anyone who makes something. So it then got put, put into uh, uh, the name Cord Wainer. What's the very first step uh, in making a boot? Well, firstly, you select the leather to go with a particular design. Then you give it to the cutters, and they've got varying shape knives where they will actually cut the leather, which ultimately, when sewn together, makes the what we call the upper, the top part of the shoe. So, Graham, what's going on here? Well, they're actually skiving the edge of the leather. They're reducing the edge so that when we overlap them, we don't get a, a big bulky seam. Skiving, it looks like pretty hard work to me. It is, it is, it's really hard work. Um, so how come it, it's come to mean, you know, sort of like dodging off work? Well, I don't know how that, that came about, but all I do know is that when we have advertise for skivers, we get a lot of applicants. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> Everything's been stitched together. So what's happening here, Graham? Well, she's closing in the upper at the moment, where they join, join, the, join the front to the back. Oh, I see. So this, this is this is an upper. That's an upper, yes. So yes. that when they're saying uh, when you're down to your uppers, I suppose it means you've you've worn out your soul. That's right. <laughs> you've worn the soul completely out, and so you're down on the upper, which is the top part of the shoe. As recently as 200 years ago, shoes were made exactly the same for each foot no left or right, and one foot was almost certain to be more uncomfortable than the other. Therefore, everyone had a best foot. Hence the expression, put your best foot forward. So here we are, the finished boot with its airwear sole. And this one, this model's called a 1460. Why is that, Graham? Well, uh, it's called that because the very first pair was made in this country on the 1st of April, 1960. 1st of April is April Fool's Day. Is that a true story? Yes, I, it's absolutely true. Oh, well, one of those coincidences. <laughs> Graham, thanks very much for showing us round. OK, you're Sharing very all well. the phrases and words. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye. You wouldn't think it, but the word sabotage has something to do with footwear too. Sabots were wooden clogs worn by French peasants, and at the time of the Industrial Revolution, protesters against modern machinery would throw their clogs into the machinery, causing it to come to a standstill. Hence the word sabotage. And maybe clogged up. Time for me to put my best foot forward now and see some boots on other feet. Football boots, to be precise. But is it football or is it soccer? I've never been really sure. This is the Rushton Diamond Stadium, built by the Doc Martens owner, Max Griggs, who loves the game. Today, the Diamonds reserves are playing Stoke City reserves. Oh! Rumour has it 
that in the old days, in order to distinguish between football and rugby, they decided to call football association football. Rugby was already known as rugby football. And a schoolboy, when asked which sport he'd like to do, he said, a soccer, short for association. And over time, when the A was dropped off, that's how we got the word soccer from association. The word fan is short for fanatic, and we've been using it since the 19th century. In the early days of radio commentary, listeners were given a grid to work from so they could follow the play. And one of the corners was known as square one. And that's where we get the saying, back to square one. <laughs> and they've equalised. As we can hear from the supporters. Loads of everyday phrases these days like I'm gutted, over the moon, it's a game of two halves, sick of the parrot, on the head, son. And then there's the language, warlike language, like it's a massacre, murder, torture. As Bill Shankly said, football isn't a matter of life and death, it's much more important than that. Diamonds! 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 <laughs> of course, football isn't just a game of skill, it's a very physical game too. You imagine two guys sliding into each other, going for the ball, you could sustain an injury. But I'll just ask them if they can teach me a thing or two. Oh, Dave, is it, is it possible for you to teach me a few skills? Oh, what sort of skills? Well, uh, dead ball skills. You know, I've always wanted to do a, a dipping banana shot that would not make the goalie. Well, first you've got to learn how to place the ball. Like that? Yeah. All right. Oh, <laughs> this is stupid. I really think I've done with back. Hey, someone get a physio! Hey. Physio! Just a steady walk, Ken. Right. How embarrassing. <laughs> the physio should sort me out. I think he knows a trick or two about muscles and injuries. Physio is short for physiotherapist, and the name comes from two Greek words. Physis, meaning nature, and therapia, meaning healing. So you could say that physiotherapy meant natural healing. Simon Parcell is a physio and his healing hands take care of the Rushton diamonds. Oh, that's much better. Oh, I suppose in your line, Simon, you've got to know just about every part of the body. Yes, you certainly have. In fact, I'm coming down now and massaging your uh, hamstrings. As, uh, How'd they get that name, then? It's quite interesting, actually, that it comes from uh, the days whereby they used to hang the hams in the, uh, in the sheds and they put weights on the bottom to obviously stretch the ham out and uh, that's where the, the hamstrings get their name from. Working down now actually onto your um, Achilles tendons um, and they come from obviously uh, a bit of Greek uh, mythology I believe from Achilles whose yeah. mother held him into the, the waters which are meant to be magical waters um, and his whole body was covered apart from obviously his uh, Achilles tendon. Actually massage is a French word that comes from the Arabic massa to touch or handle. I must say, this is doing me a world of good. God, thanks, Simon. That feels a hundred times better. So, what's the verdict? Do you really want to know the truth, Neil? Don't hold back. You're definitely overweight and you need more exercise. How much more exercise? A lot more exercise. Mm -hmm. We all know the word gym is short for gymnasium, but did you know that gymnasium comes from the Greek word gymnos, which means naked? Early gymnasts exercised naked. Oh well, I suppose it saves on the laundry. <sighs> How's that? Well, after your ten circuits, I think you're ready for a run in the country. What? Off you go. <sighs> oh, 
All this exercise has given me an appetite. I must have lost a few pounds by now. Time to put some more on, I think. I could murder a barbecue. It wasn't my idea to dress up like this. It was, uh, guess who, the producer. And I said, why? She just said, well, somebody flicking across the channels might think this is one of those celebrity chef programmes. And stay tuned. Frankly, I've given up arguing. Anyway, there are lots of sayings and words connected with food, like in the soup, to be in a bit of a pickle, best thing since sliced bread. So here I am preparing a little modest repast. <laughs> now, I'm cooking breast of chicken here, but um, you've probably all heard of the Parsons nose. Well, that probably goes back to the days when it was called the Pope's nose. Just after the reign of James II, who was very pro-Catholic, the people, on the other hand, were very anti-Catholic, so they called that rather snubbly bit the Pope's nose, and it somehow stuck as the Parsons nose. In here we've got some broad beans, and some good old spuds. More of them later. Anyway, isn't the view wonderful? This is the view you see from Rockingham Castle every evening. In the absence of wine, I'll have a grape. Mmm, mmm, let me do all this. Mm, I'm getting, what am I getting? I'm getting cucumbers, grass mowings, old tyres, Lego. I can't say that, can I? All right. Shop-bought mayonnaise. Let's have a look at these biscuits. Cut away on these biscuits. Whole biscuits are fine, but I prefer mine distressed. Biscuit is an old French word. Qui meaning cooked, and bis twice. Although some things you can't cook enough. See these beans? Get a good look in there. You see, now these I like to boil the beans nearly dry because, you know, if you let them boil dry, then there has beans. But now they still got a chance. And just, uh, just keep looking at the view. That doesn't come cheaply, you know. This kind of television. Oh no, this isn't ready, steady, whatever they do. It's quite hold, hard to hold that still, believe it or not. Now, I've always called a spud a spud, because the word spud is Old English, and it's another name for spade. I bet you didn't know that. Time for another little slurpet. Well, it's a young slurpet. Salad gets its name from the famous musical Salad Days. God, those grapes are strong. Chipolatas a la revoltingly greasy. I love the impression of this kind of garnish on the paper plate of some poil. Gives that true outdoor look and a kind of techno feel to modern eating. I think a little garnish. Voila. I can't think of a nicer way of ending this program than finishing off the food with some friends right here who very kindly allowed us cook in this wonderful setting at Rockingham Castle. Let's have another look at that view, shall we? See, the neighbours are putting up a shed. You can't put that shed up there, not without planning permission. Oh well, that's it from Away With Words this week. Until next time, bye-bye.